Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdell, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's June 2020, and you're listening to episode 189, which is a conversation about choosing to pursue vocation over performance-based success, which can be quite difficult in Western culture. This is a theme in The Confidential Clerk, a play by the 20th century writer and poet T.S. Eliot. On this episode, I'm joined by journal author Stephen Mitchell, who holds a Ph.D. in humanities and teaches English at Covenant Day School in North Carolina. Stephen has written a literary apologetics feature article for the Christian Research Journal in our recently released Volume 43, Number 1 print issue, and his article is called Second Rate Musician, Vocation and Performance in T.S. Eliot's The Confidential Clerk. You can read it if you subscribe to our magazine, which you can subscribe to at our website, equip.org. Stephen, it's good to have you on. Thank you, Melanie. It's good to be here. Well, your particular article is a literary apologetics article, and it involves a writer who's known for poetry named T.S. Eliot. And so I would like to have you talk to our readers a little bit about who T.S. Eliot was, and why is he somebody that is of value or his works are of value to those who are Christian apologists? Sure. So T.S. Eliot, as you said, known primarily for poetry. In fact, he won the Nobel Prize, I believe it was 1948, uh, for his contribution to poetry. Um, He was born in the late, late 19th century and lived into uh, roughly the middle of the 20th century, died, I think, in the mid-60s. And he was a leader, really, in the modernist movement of poetry, which was this um, attempt to kind of reclaim poetry from what um, what a lot of modernists saw, some of the excesses that had preceded them immediately. And, and so this was poetry that was very dense with imagery, um, and tried to kind of strip down the language, but but make it dense, vivid. And it was also highly elusive, um, especially Eliot's work, highly elusive. In other words, he was a deeply learned man, a, a deeply erudite poet. And his poetry would, would build on images from ancient poetry, from Eastern poetry, from Western poetry, literature, philosophy, religion, all of these different genres and and he would combine these images together to create these incredible poems that were particularly good i think at capturing the anxiety and the uncertainty uh the religious um ambiguity and ambivalence of the modern era and frankly of a kind of a sensibility that not only for the modernist had poetry been in decline but that Western civilization itself had been in decline. And much, especially of his early poetry, of course, captured this. Probably his most famous work of all is The Wasteland, which the structure of the poem kind of mimics a bombed out landscape, reminiscent of some of the effects of World War I upon the sensibility of these poets. So Eliot was widely known. He kind of was the leader of this modernist movement. Uh, he founded a journal called The Modern Age. He was an essayist. He, was, uh, he became a playwright as well. Um, and he was followed and influenced by the great poets and intellectuals of the early 20th century. I think what makes him particularly valuable for apologists is that Eliot's own intellectual journey was an intellectual journey from a kind of hybrid Eastern Platonistic universalism. He was raised in the Universalist Church, the Unitarian Universalist Church, to a very traditional Anglican Christianity. And this took place over a a series of of decades, really. And his poetry and his writing, of course, it works through all of that, really, from the early days when the world seemed to be a wasteland and 
you know, he and other poets were wondering if they could kind of put the world back together by using pieces of old culture to his um, later work, maybe some of his loveliest work, I think, the four quartets, which are this kind of four poems that work together to kind of convey the souls, the human soul's movement from despair into the presence of God and um, are deeply influenced by Dante and his work, The Divine Comedy. Eliot engaged the modern world intellectually, philosophically, religiously, poetically, sociologically. I mean, all of it. He was just deeply engaged that way. And his essays, of course, are rich with this criticism of a kind of agnostic world and a recognition, for Eliot at least, that uh, the Christian faith offers, well, it, it offers a truth that the world needs and that Eliot felt he needed. And it does so, th- you know, through a clear awareness of how the modern world was different from the ancient world. In other words, Eliot didn't just try to sort of jump back into and become a medievalist or something like that, but rather to figure out a way that one could live in the modern world as a modern person and also be a Christian. And his work just takes up those intellectual struggles in an articulate and profound way. And that, I think, is why uh, he would be of interest specifically to people interested in apologetics. Well, specifically, your feature article in the volume 43, number one print issue of our journal deals with his play, The Confidential Clerk, and your article in particular critiques meritocracy. Mm -hmm. So I'd like you to define meritocracy for our listeners. What is it and why are you critical of it? Sure. So meritocracy probably has as many definitions as there are you know, people to talk about it. But one definition that I include in the article and really that I work with and and critique um, is provided by David Brooks. I really think it is probably the most prescient definition or description of the meritocracy. And it, it refers to this achievement culture that marks certainly the United States, or at least the middle class and the upper middle classes of the United States. And I think probably the the same around the world right now amongst the affluent. And it's this idea that we really at its root, that through our achievements, we create our identities. And it's rooted, of course, the root is merit. And there's an implicit assumption in here that if you are part of the meritocracy, of course, you undoubtedly deserve your good fortune or or what good things happen to you. In fact, it probably wouldn't recognize anything like good fortune because in fact, you have achieved, you have accomplished, you have created, you have acted. And because of your effort, you have become this accomplished, polished, successful, affluent, and confident person. That is kind of how the meritocracy works. Why I'm critical of it There's a number of reasons. Primarily in the article, I'm critical of it because I think it shifts identity to the wrong foundation. It uh, it shifts it away from where a Christian understanding of selfhood and identity would, would place it. It's not even so much what people do, right? Because the fact is that whether we understand ourselves to be meritocrats or whether we, you know, have this idea of vocation that I talk about, we have to do things in the world. We have to perform. Uh, we have to uh, uh, ch- achieve things. We have responsibilities um, to use our gifts, um, our abilities, our opportunities in the world. But the meritocracy, as David Brooks uh, defines it, is, is one, I'll just actually read just one quick line. It's a way of life that emphasizes individual achievement, self-proposal, perpetual improvement, and permanent exertion. The way we realize our potential is through our activities. By ceaselessly striving to improve at the things we enjoy, we come to define, enlarge, and attain our best selves. And so it is this ethic of perfection through effort. And it precludes a number of things, one of which is rest. You know, if I only am who I am, 
by virtue of what I do, then the, there's an implication here that is at least deeply psychological, if not, if not utterly logical. It's, it's certainly this pressure is that I have to continually perform this way. And of course, we have a faith, right, which is rooted in the idea of rest, specifically of Sabbath rest, because of the, um, the work of God to create and then the incarnate work of God to redeem, we can live from a position of rest. The meritocracy doesn't recognize that because it doesn't recognize um, God as the foundation of our being. And this isn't to say that, that meritocrats can't be religious. Many, 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 many are. So this is you know, an idea that makes its way into our thinking, whether we identify as religious people or not, or Christians or not. But it eliminates rest, and it has this other implication that I think will develop later on, but that is that it's up to me to make myself of value, and it's up to me to make myself good. And I don't mean by that so much morally good as I mean ontologically good. Rather than, if we go back to the Genesis account, for example, where the narrative is that God creates the world and declares it to be good. And then, of course, creates humanity and declares it to be very good. And that goodness, that affirmation of that, that what is ought to be and is worth, has worth and value, is worthy of our praise even, that idea doesn't really have room in the meritocracy or in meritocratic thought because we don't become until we act. Whereas I think if you take the Genesis account, for example, you act because you have become. Now, of course, there is some overlap here because we, you know, if, for example, we, we just go through, say, the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, and there's this continual reference to Israel as the planting of God, this tree or this crop that bears fruit. And so there is process and there is growth and there is movement in a Christian view of vocation as there is in a meritocratic view of achievement. But the difference is that in the Christian view of vocation, I think there is this, uh, and, and I, the language is a metaphor, but it comes right out of scripture. There is a kind of fruitfulness, a fruiting, a blossoming of what we are kind of in embryonic form throughout our lives. And in the meritocracy, there is this kind of, of forceful shaping of ourselves. David Brooks calls it the bricks of our identity. And, I, and while I don't think he's intending to this, I always, whenever I read that, I think of the Tower of Babel, honestly, and that, that image of a society building itself, right? Let us make a name for ourselves, I think the passage says. And so I think that the meritocracy in our country is a little more in line with kind of the virtues of the biblical story of Babel than, say, the virtues of the city of Jerusalem. So, you know, you could even talk of this in terms of Augustine's city of God, the city of Jerusalem and the city of Babel. So that's a quick rendering of what I'm talking about in the meritocracy. And I do want to point out that David Brooks, and this, to be fair to him, this is a little bit of an older piece, and he has recently published a book, The Second Mountain, where he's far more critical of the meritocracy. His thinking on this has developed quite a lot. But I use the critique in the article, or I use the passage in the article, because I still think it is the best description that I've seen of how the meritocracy works and how it functions and how we are encouraged by our culture to think as meritocrats and the need to challenge that regularly with a sort of renewing of our of a Christian understanding of, of the self and of identity. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Dr. Stephen Mitchell. He has written a literary apologetics feature article for the current print edition of the Christian Research Journal, which is volume 43, number one, and his article is called Second Rate Musician, Vocation and Performance in T.S. Eliot's The Confidential Clerk. Read his article when you subscribe to our magazine, which you can do so at our website, equip.org. Other ways in which you can interact with us and help us continue to produce this podcast and other free content on our website is to partner with us 
in one of three ways. First of all, subscribe so you can read this article. Second of all, if a subscription is not in your budget this month, please think of tipping us, which you can do on our website. You go to equip.org, go to magazine at the drop down menu. You'll see Postmodern Realities Podcast. If you click on that, you can hit the landing page for this episode or any episode, and you can find the link to tip us something like $3, $5, something like that. Maybe you've been saving money on eating out or going to movies or other things during this time in 2020. So we would really appreciate you giving us a little tip for the content that we produce for you. And really the best way that you can help us out is to please rate and review our podcast, which you can do on Apple Podcasts, search for Postmodern Realities. And it's one of those things you think, oh, I'm going to do it, but you never get around to it. So take some time right now and head over there give us a starred review or even better yet. If you have a minute, just jot down a reason why you enjoy listening to this podcast in a quick sentence or two, and we'd be very grateful. And thank you for supporting the outreach of the Christian Research Journal. You're talking to us about meritocracy, and in your article, you link meritocracy to the vice of acedia. So what is acedia, and why do meritocratic values leave us susceptible to it. Yeah. So acedia is this, it's, it's an unfamiliar word to us really in modern times. And that's unfortunate because I think it's a particularly apt word to describe a spiritual vice. I would say that the, that, that contemporary people, um, that we're particularly susceptible to. So acedia really developed, uh, they a robust, um, conversation or a robust lexicon around the idea of a sadia developed in the in the Middle Ages in the High Middle Ages, and it it described what what Christian thinkers and theologians came to see as a vice of a kind of despair. Uh, Joseph Pieper, the twentieth century German theologian, though I think gives one of the most helpful definitions of it, especially for understanding how it describes our world today, and that he says it is essentially. Um, Asadia is sadness at the goodness of being. And as odd as that definition sounds, what he's getting at is that if being, if existence, our own and, other, and all other things are already good, then they impinge upon us, they make a claim upon us. If their goodness precedes our own assessment of their goodness, then it becomes something we are bound to recognize in a way submit to rather than uh, leaving us, as we might be inclined to say today, free to determine whether you know, any particular thing in the world or in existence is intrinsically good or not. Well, it wouldn't be intrinsic, I'm sorry, but whether it has goodness or not, according to its value to us. So a sadia comes in because, because a world exists prior to our own will, and by so doing, it makes a claim upon us that comes to limit, either demand something of us that we may not want to give or limit us from doing something that we may not want to do. And the way it manifests tends, it, it can manifest in a couple of ways. It was also considered a kind of spiritual laziness. That's another sort of colloquial way to speak about it because the souls, the idea of man on the way, that humanity is born into this world in part to rise to divine communion, divine union and, and understanding and knowledge of God. And Asadia doesn't want to do that. Either it thinks it's not possible and so gives up, or that sort of growth into unity, knowledge of communion with God um, would require a, a denial of of other appetites and desires. So it can become laziness in that the development of one's spirit is neglected. But that laziness doesn't necessarily manifest in physical laziness. And this is where the meritocracy becomes an interesting manifestation of a sadia. Because if there is no intrinsic goodness to existence, if there is no intrinsic identity, good identity that I am responsible to, in some sense, discover and develop and fulfill, then, of course, I am left to decide one of two things. Either I don't have to do anything or I can kind of enter into this 
pursuit of a different kind of perfection, my own vision of perfection, or what is much more likely to be the case, the reigning vision of perfection in my society. And so asadia, can, it, it would be the, the neglect of the, of the development of one's soul, one's God-given identity, one's God-given vocation, and that would be the spiritual laziness, and that would be supplanted by, or can be supplanted by, this meritocratic pursuit of an alternate vision of perfection. Again, if we go back to that image, which I think is excellent, that biblical image of the Tower of Babel, if we see what goes on there, they gather together, they decide to build a city, they decide to build a tower, they decide to make a name for themselves, right? They are active people. They are engaged in the world. They're building, I mean, to build a city, that's a, that's a social endeavor, that's an economic endeavor, that's a philosophical endeavor. It requires all the efforts of culture and often of religion to bring it about. But it's done so, right, with man and their own particular conception of their greatness as their central motivation. And that's the, the danger with meritocratic values and meritocratic way of living is that it, it puts in another image of perfection for this idea that the soul or this notion coming out of scripture and the Jewish Christian tradition that the soul is made to know God and that that kind of perfection doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the sorts of ambitious, success-oriented perfections that anyone's culture, but ours particularly right now, anyone's culture values. It's not to say that there's never overlap, but if we are not aware that it is that the, the purpose of our lives are to meet and know God, to become this person that we were created to become, then we are essentially denying the goodness of the being that God has given us, becoming sad at the goodness of our own being, and asserting another vision of goodness. I had a conversation with a colleague a few years ago that really helped me with this, we were talking about trying to help some of our students understand that vocation, finding the work God has for you to do, is more important than financial success, right? And most Christians would immediately agree with that. And I was saying something along the lines of finding work that fits who you are. And this friend of mine very wisely pointed out, well, it's not really about your job, it's about the person that you are becoming. And what she saw those years ago that was sort of off in my own thinking was that I had assumed that your vocation to, to becoming God-like, to becoming, to bearing and manifesting the image of God, and your day-to-day -day work are always going to link up. And she understood that those two things won't always link up. But, but, and that's why she said, I think accurately, that what's important is the person you become. But of course, if we're not careful, that can sound like what David Brooks is saying, but the difference here is that my friend understood that the person you become is a development of an identity given you by God. And Brooks, at least at the time he wrote this article, saw that the person you became was a series of choices that you made and you decided upon, right, based upon your own efforts. And so that is why I cast this critical eye on meritocracy, and that is why I think it leads us perilously close, if we are not careful of it, to this vice of asadia, because we will mistake the true perfection of our souls for a false perfection. Now, you're already alluding this to a little bit um, in your comments, but in your article, you suggest that the Christian understanding of vocation is a richer way of life than meritocracy. So how does vocation provide an alternative to the contemporary notion that we have of meritocracy? Sure. Well, one way is that vocation is rooted fundamentally in divine action, right? The, the priority, the ontological and the theological priority is given to God. We have to still act. We have responsibilities to fulfill our beings and our persons. We can think of the um, 
the parable in the New Testament where Christ talks about the, t- the, the, the three servants with the talents, right? And each was expected to develop those talents. And of course, the one who did not was, was severely reprimanded as a result. But vocation recognizes that, that I am called into being by God, right? Through a process of growth, and refinement and perfection into, and this is actually still, I mean, we have it now, but it's still, if you will, in our future, into perfect communion with God, that a human life is essentially a pilgrimage. It is a movement from one thing to another. One of the things that meritocracy, of course, also tends to foster is competitiveness, because our identities are rooted only in our own actions, if somebody's actions outstrip mine, if somebody outperforms me, if they, if they do more things or seem to achieve you know, more success, however that is defined in the moment, then they become greater than me, better than me. And I have to up my game, if you will, in order to not be surpassed. This can lead to some incredible forms of achievement, but but it's it's deeply stressful. And it implies, again, that you are not fundamentally in your deepest being of any real value, that your value comes from your actions. Vocation, by contrast, says you act because you are already of value. Because you are a value, because you have been created by, given being, given existence by a God who made you in his image and who made you to grow into knowledge of him, grow into relationship with him. And so vocation, one thing it lets me do is, in a way, forget about what other people are doing. What I mean by that is I don't have to look at my, you know, what I'm doing with my life, how I'm living it and ask whether it's as good as the next person's, I look at my life and I ask, am I living faithful to what, you know, the spirit of God in his work in my life is calling me to, given my circumstances and my gifts and, you know, all of the other things that we feel shape us and that limit us, right? My past, my gifts, my geography, you know, the political entity, the nation that I'm a part of, right? All of these things will, of course, shape what we can do. But the Christian notion of vocation allows us to accept those as providentially part of the way he guides us. And so we can rest with the Christian notion of vocation. Fundamentally, it is divine, the perpetual power and will of God that undergirds our identity, not our own perpetual will and perpetual power. And if this is correct, of course, then we're going to tap into the truest expression of ourselves. We're going to know who we are. We're going to know what we're supposed to do and not do here. I don't mean that this is easy, but we're going to know these things And we're going to be able to live a life that is at once excellent and restful. And that's why I think that vocation offers us a richer notion for life than does meritocracy. So if Christians reject meritocracy with its foundations in competition, where do we find the motivation to pursue excellence? And I think specifically for Christians in the West, in in, in particular in America, Mm -hmm. you know, we have this idea and this notion of the American dream and, and that has so much, I mean, there's a lot involved in that, but one of those things is very consumer driven. Mm -hmm. And so with that idea of consumerism and competition, we've been trained and you work with students and a lot of students have been trained mm-hmm. that vocation, I mean, it's almost to the point of higher education these days has turned into maybe more of an intellectual version of trade school because we mm-hmm. have to find the job that will pay us 
the most. most and so we get swept up in, or students right. get swept up in the idea of competition and consumerism mm -hmm. in this pursuit of the American dream. And so in rethinking vocation for the Christian so that we embrace um, a more biblical view of these things instead of, you know, a cultural one, mm -hmm. you know, where do we find the motivation for this? And how do you encourage students and, and, and parents? Because I think of myself as, you know, I have a parent and, uh, with mm -hmm. a child that's an adult, but also a child still in high school. And I would say that many parents around me are themselves pressuring their kids, maybe mm -hmm. not overtly, but to buy into mm -hmm. the whole notion of consumerism and competition and the American dream. And so there's certain expectations that they have about vocation in it of itself that certain mm -hmm. vocations don't have value. Right. Yeah, man, that's, that's a lot of, of, that's a lot there and it's good. Um, and, and it's a, man, it's a problem I see and I see in myself too, right? This struggle is, is present for all of us. Um, probably we should take a moment to make a distinction here that uh, I haven't done yet. So this word vocation is understood in our times, but it's understood differently than it's typically meant in religious terms, which is how we're using it. So in religious terms, as we're using it, vocation refers to the calling of one's being by God. Whereas in our modern times, and this is an interesting, maybe it's a coincidence, I don't really think so, but in our modern times, right, vocation is limited to a description of your job. And so we're, when we talk about vocation versus meritocracy, of course, we're talking about the calling of one's person into being and through the process of, of becoming, right, into union with God. But but how do we maintain excellence? Well, and yeah, I'm not thinking of just vocation in terms of job, although that's part of that in my question. Yeah, I didn't think but, you were. And I haven't read his particular play. I mean, I've read more of his poems. But I do think that even if we're talking about the pursuit of God in our being uh -huh. by how we're living and different callings. Uh -huh. I think the idea, I think there is particularly an American idea that as we see it culturally would, that would reject calling in a sense mm -hmm. that it's, we, we would suppress calling over other mm -hmm. things. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you're right. That we see our society or that are more societally acceptable. Exactly. If that makes sense. Like, sure, you can pursue knowing God, but in these particular parameters, because that's more holy and that will be better and more acceptable mm -hmm. than your pursuit in other ways, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'm following you here. Um, so we definitely, our children experience this. Sometimes we put the pressure on them. Sometimes we experience this pressure, right, to succeed in in the terms of of money or prestige. I think there's a lot to prestige as well, to whatever institutions or, or professions have prestige associated with them, which, which often comes with money. The ability to step aside from that, though, just one thing, it requires continual spiritual formation. I mean, we have to reform our thinking, right, on scripture and on the theological traditions that Christianity offers us. There's a constant, if you will, renewing of our mind that has to go on. Um, but we find excellence, I think there's still room for excellence, but it will look different, right? It, it doesn't look like perpetual unending effort because I think in the biblical economy, if we could use this word, rest is an important part of a life of excellence, not just so you can recoup your energies to go on, but because it's in those times of rest that you have special opportunity to know and commune with God, right? We have Sabbath for that. It's, it's not the only place, but we can do that. So there's that difference that you have to hold on to. But the Christian notion of vocation is a notion of becoming, right? It is an idea that involves movement from and to. And so that notion of becoming does require something of us, right? And we can think of Paul's claim toward the end of his life in the epistles, right? He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, and henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So Paul uses actually competitive language from sport to describe his own Christian faithfulness 
But Paul wasn't seeking social prestige in any of that. He wasn't seeking financial success in any of that. And very often that meant the opposite, right? He spent time in prison, incredible amount of time in prison, right? He was often cast out of towns. Not that that should be our goal, but sometimes he was forcibly removed from different cities that he went to. And of course, he was executed for his faith. And so the becoming of Paul's soul, the transformation of Paul into the image of Christ required a kind of spiritual excellence, a kind of attention to the voice of God and the calling of God upon his life. But it freed him from worrying about whether he was popular or whether he was financially successful or whether he was socially renowned or socially respected, so on and so forth. And so, you know, there's this verse in Revelation, the the second chapter of Revelation that I think speaks to this. It's really interesting. In chapter 2, verse 17, and it says, essentially, it's part of the verse, to him who overcomes will I give a stone, uh, a white stone with a new name in it that no man knows save he that receives it. And I mean, I know that Revelation is one of the more difficult texts of the scriptures to understand, but that verse has always seemed to speak to me of this kind of point of arrival, when one finally faces whatever it is we face at the end, when we account for our lives before uh, the God who who made us, that there's a, a naming ceremony, if you will, that goes on there that tells us who and what we have become. And it requires, even in that language, an overcoming. So it obviously does require something of us. In that sense, there's an effort involved. But it's an effort that recognizes, first, that God was the first to act, and God is the one whose action sustains us. And second, of course, that grace is the thing which ultimately draws us to the perfection of our souls and our readiness then to be with God. So we are going to have a very different form of excellence. Now, we will live in this world, and so it may be that as we pursue you know, the perfection of our being toward God, the movement of it toward God, that we also achieve some measure of social success. We, we shouldn't under, expect that the things that will lead us to perfection are inherently contrary to the things that human beings need to do, right? God made us. A human life is an excellent thing in and of itself because it's a divine gift. And so human forms of excellence aren't necessarily at odds, if you would, with divine forms of excellence. But again, the place from which we act is going to make the difference. One is going to keep before us our communion with God. The other is going to keep before us the accolades of our society. And that is what makes the difference. So there is still a God we answer to, provides the motivation for excellence, as does the fact that He's given us a really wonderful gift that is our person, and that the development of that person is in part its own reward. But that is not a God who is a kind of relentless and demanding perfectionist. I think of a play, a different play by Robert Bolt called A Man for All Seasons, and a character in that play says to the main character, Thomas More, that in his mind, God demands effort unstinting and relentless. And Thomas More, the great British Catholic jurist, replies, are you sure that's God? That sounds like Moloch to me. And of course, Moloch is the deity from the Old Testament who is apparently part of worship of Moloch was was human sacrifice. You know, the meritocracy, whether it recognizes a God or not, requires effort unstinting and unyielding. That's its only understanding of excellence. Christian vocation recognizes that we are already created and made with goodness inherent in our being. And that call in us, that call to us, is what leads us through excellence and what defines excellence for us. Vocation limits us. If I'm called to do a particular thing, whether that is well recognized in my society or not, I am pursuing excellence if I pursue it. And of course, I am aided by the grace of God in the pursuit of that. I think I'll just end the answer to that question there. I could probably run on endlessly about it. Well, in your article, you specifically 
choose to write about these issues and use T.S. Eliot's play, The Confidential Clerk. So what's the basic plot of the play? And how does his play address the tension between meritocracy and vocation? Yeah. So this play, not his most well-known play, um, for sure, but I think really a lovely play. Uh, it's a comedy, really, kind of in the tradition of the drawing room comedies. So there's a character by the name of Colby Simpkins, who thinks he is the uh, the illegitimate son of a member of the British aristocracy, Sir Claude Mulhammer. And Sir Claude Mulhammer thinks this as well. They're both operating on the assumption that they are father and son. And so Colby has come of age and he has been offered a job to be Sir Claude Mulhammer's clerk, his confidential clerk. It's a kind of legal clerk. With the plan eventually for Sir Claude to reveal to his wife and the rest of the family and their friends and acquaintances that Colby is his son. And Colby intends to accept the job. In fact, as the play opens, he's already beginning to work it. But the problem is that Colby long before had this desire to be an organist. He is musically gifted. He's quite talented at it. And he wanted to be an organist. But he discovered as he practiced that he would never be what he calls a first-rate organist that he would be second rate. He could not hope to achieve the kind of world-class artistry that, you know, the the great and the few musicians attain. As a result of that, he decides to give that up as, you know, he might dabble in music on the side, but he more or less gives it up, figures out he can succeed quite a lot in business, beginning as a legal clerk for his father, And so he gives up this gift of music that he has, and he takes up business. And there's where the tension is, because in fact, as the play develops, we see that Colby has what we would call a vocation to music. It's in that work that he finds his most fulfillment. It's in that work that he connects to people, and he connects people to the music, and there are implications in the play somehow to God. Well, The play, various comic things happen, and it comes out eventually that Colby is not Sir Claude Mulhammer's son. And Colby finds out that his own father, his real father, was, of all things, a second-rate musician, as he puts it, or a, a church organist, but not a famous one. And Colby has to make a decision. I can continue in business where I know I can succeed financially. Or I can follow, as he puts it, follow my father, and I can follow this gift I have. And he actually chooses the latter. He chooses then to become a church organist in a rural parish where he's going to work amongst common people, not amongst the sophisticated, not amongst the affluent. He won't be paid much. In fact, he'll have to find alternate work to fully support himself. But he'll be using that musical gift which he has to minister to the souls of others and to develop in his own person. And so in brief, that's the choice, right? And it's very stark. And in that play, of course, he makes the right one. It's interesting that his, not really his father, but when he thought his father, Sir Claude Mulhammer, had made the opposite decision. He had wanted to be a potter, a ceramicist, but he didn't think himself good enough. And so he chose business over this other art. And I don't think Eliot intends to necessarily pose art against business as a more essential human endeavor. But his point in all of this is to show that there are other scales by which to measure excellence than sort of being the best, you know, amongst others of a thing, you know, at at any one action. One doesn't have to be the best musician to have a vocation to music. One doesn't have to be the best artist to have a vocation to art. One doesn't have to be the best writer to have a vocation to writing. And of course, at a deeper level, the play shows that Colby's real vocation is to, again, prepare his soul for eventual union with God. And so ultimately, it's not about whether you're the best at any one thing or not, because your job, if you will, your vocation is to become 
Colby's vocation is to become the person that he was, to use a very common phrase, he was created to be. And, and this puts him outside of all competitive rankings and hierarchies altogether, right? Colby can't be, nobody can be a better Colby than Colby can be. Only Colby Simpkins could be an excellent Colby Simpkins. And that's fundamentally what the play is about, that we, each of us, are gifted our being. It is good intrinsically because it is a gift from a good God. And it bears with it a responsibility to develop that gift in excellence with the limitations that come with that gift. Colby cannot become a world-class musician, but he doesn't have to, right? He can, if we can put it this way, he can become a world-class Colby. And while that may tend to lean and sound a little bit sentimental, it's profoundly refreshing and freeing to learn that I do not have to achieve what other people achieve in order for my life to have meant something, in order for my person to have you know, profound value, in order for my work to matter. What I have to do is be faithful to the being that God has created me to become. And so that's how the confidential clerk addresses the tension between meritocracy and vocation and offers a picture, I think a rich picture, of how much more fulfilling one's life can be when vocation is preferred to meritocracy. Well, finally, I would like to end this podcast by asking Stephen some fun rapid fire questions. Sure. So during the quarantine that's mm -hmm. ending in some places at your house, did you guys go to comfort food? Were you healthy or did you do takeout to support local restaurants in your area? We did pretty good with uh, being healthy, but I have to say there were a lot of cookies baked, a lot of brownies, a lot of apple crisp, that sort of thing. Um, so healthy food, but, but our own fair share of comfort food for sure. What's something that's on your bucket list? Oh, I would love to hike the Camino del Santiago, uh, the way of St. James that's in runs through Spain and France. It's 500 miles. Take me about five weeks, but some summer when my children are a little bit older, uh, maybe with one or both of them, I would really like to hike that trail. So. We know that you're a teacher who teaches English, and we've been talking about T.S. Eliot's play, The Confidential Clerk. So is there a work of classic literature that you would suggest for our listeners for them to put on their summer reading lists that Christians you think should read? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, oh, I would say I, just the first one that always comes to mind when a question like this is asked is Crime and Punishment. Just a stellar work of literature. And that's the one I would recommend. One of my favorites. I would say that's a very good book, but it's probably not beach reading. Or if you are going to read at the beach, just <laughs> it's not beach know in reading. advance. It's intense. It's an intense book. So finally, we have toilet paper in stores these days, but yeah. there was a shortage for some time. So at your house, do you guys hang it over or under? Uh, it goes over in my house for sure. Comes off the top. Well, thank you, Stephen, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you, Melanie. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest has been Dr. Stephen Mitchell. He has written a literary apologetics feature article for the Christian Research Journal in our recently released Volume 43, Number One Print issue in 2020, and it's called Second-Rate Musician, Vocation and Performance in T.S. Eliot's The Confidential Clerk. Read his article by subscribing to our magazine at our website, equip.org. We'd like to hear from you, so connect with us on social media. Like the Bible Answer Man Facebook page and follow CRI, Christian Research Journal, Hank Hanegraaff, and the Bible Answer Man on Twitter. And please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man channel on YouTube. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the Postmodern Realities Podcast on iTunes, and please rate and review our podcast. When you rate and review our podcast, it helps others see our content. And please share this episode on your social media accounts. 
Be sure you tune in daily to the Bible Answer Man broadcast hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff, who answers your questions live on air. To ask Hank a question, call 888-ASK-HANK, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. In addition, head to iTunes and subscribe to Hank Unplugged, Hank's audio podcast. Follow Hank off the grid, where he has in-depth conversations with some of the brightest minds discussing topics you care about. So until our next Christian Research Journal author conversation, thanks for listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast.